Good morning, everybody. Well, welcome, everybody, to our service this morning. If you're a visitor, we're sure glad to have you. And if you're interested in making us at your church home, just see one of us, and we'll sure, certainly help you with that. <clears throat> I'm reading this morning from First Chronicles. By the way, I, my allergies have paid me a visit, so my voice goes astray. Just be understanding, please. Read uh, First Chronicles uh, chapter 16, uh, verse 29 and following. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning to worship you and praise your holy name. Lord, we ask that you accept our worship this morning as a tribute to you and, and love and, and help us to uh, make our worship good to your ears. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and sing. Our opening hymn will be Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Let's all greet somebody.
Our second hymn will be Cornerstone. seated. Our hymn of communion will be broken and spilled out. I love this story. This song comes from the story of in the Gospels where a woman anointed Jesus. She broke open her alabaster box and poured out spikenard, a very costly um, oil of that day poured out her precious treasure on his feet, or on his head, depending on which gospel you read. But when she, she broke that ointment out and gave her worship, gave everything she had in worship to Jesus, the fragrance of that worship, the aroma filled the room. There was no denying that she loved her Lord. There was no denying that she um, poured everything out for him. So what would it be like today 
if as we are focusing on Jesus and worshiping him, we give him our all, we give him everything in our worship, we give him everything in our lives, that fragrance will, will uh, fill the room. It will, go, it will go out wherever we are. That aroma of worship will touch people. People will be drawn. Now, the word says that uh, to some, it's the fragrance, the aroma of life. To others, it's the stench of death. Uh, but we, we want to always be pouring out our worship to Jesus. We want that aroma to go out and to draw people to focus on him and to love him and worship him like we do. I'm reading this morning uh, first from Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all have had any experience with sheep. We had uh, boys that showed sheep in 4 H, showed lambs. And uh, I have found out through this that they're not particularly smart animals <laughs> uh, except when it came they would, they would walk them and do certain things to try to get their build up their muscles for, for show and they would be re very reluctant to walk out and walk around but once you turn them back toward the barn oh they were ready to go because they knew they were going to get fed 
Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the time of Christ, uh, of course, all through the Old Testament, there's uh, stories of sheep that are used for illustrations in quite a few places. At that time, the sheep were not fenced in. Uh, they were pastured out in the fields, and they had shepherds who watched them. And uh, <clears throat> they were protected them and uh, from animals and whatever else. They, uh, they followed each other. You know, if one, if one started to go to the barn, the rest of them would go. Uh, they didn't think for themselves. They just followed whatever was in front of them. And when danger came, they would scatter. Uh, they don't, didn't form a group or anything like that. Uh, the sheep at that time had to have a shepherd. I know I've seen them out in fields lately, and they're just out there, but I'm sure they bring them in at night. Uh, <clears throat> they need to be watched and protected from danger. Uh, need to be, at that time, in, in, need, need to be led from the pens to the pasture and back. Uh, the sheep at that time, of course, would know the, the particular voice of their shepherd, and that's who they would follow. Uh, <clears throat> people sometimes act like sheep, myself included. Uh, we act as a herd. We don't think for ourselves sometimes. We follow the group and <clears throat> do not seek the truth. <clears throat> for example, uh, in fashion, uh, whatever is popular is what everybody wants to wear. Uh, some of them are not very decent, but uh, some people wear them anyway. Uh, entertainment, uh, TV shows are sometimes very vulgar, uh, and tend to, or to pro and some tend to, to portray society as as not Christian or you know, didn't people didn't think for themselves. Movies the same way. News media sometimes will only tell part of the story and won't tell you. They'll tell you what they want you to hear, and they don't uh, tell you the whole truth. And they, lots of times, if you'll notice, they don't, po they don't focus on positive events. It's just the negative things. That's what they think sells newspapers and TV shows. Politics, uh, people are influenced by big money and try to f influence other people to follow the herd. <clears throat> My question is, who should we follow? And John 10, let me find it here. I'll hit it marked. There it is, it slipped down. John 10, uh, verse 7 and following. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. <clears throat> and uh, also in John 10 verse 27, <clears throat> my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Uh, we need to ask ourselves sometimes what shepherd we follow. There are shepherds out there who will lead us astray, will scatter us, will uh, uh, cause us to do wrong. Uh, but there is but one good shepherd, and that is Jesus Christ. And my <coughs> closing uh, past, past, uh, pastor here is, for you who are stirring like sheep have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. So we need to ask ourselves which shepherd we're following. Are we following Christ or are we following the shepherd of society or whatever else? 
he, Christ was the only one, the only true shepherd, the only one who ever gave his life for his sheep, who are us. So with that in mind, uh, <clears throat> we'll have communion. It's good to see everyone out this morning and uh, this beautiful Sunday. This time we'll have a prayer for your offering. And the offering plate is there on the right-hand side before you go out the door. 
Heavenly Father, again, we thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you and praise you for all your many blessings and those that you are going to give us. And Lord, we just pray that you bless this offering, that it will be for the furtherance of your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Like as I was walking up here, the back did, so I got to shove it in my pocket. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, really, really blessed to be here in the house of the Lord. And I'm just so thankful uh, for this opportunity to be here to present the word for you all today. Uh, and uh, just thank God for every instance we have to do that. Um, at this time, we'll uh, collect the pocket change. Uh, any of our young ones that want to help with that would be much appreciated. Um, for those who may not know, we collect this in addition to what we normally give to our missionaries and outreaches that we sponsor. So this would be just given in addition to what the church already gives. So if you'd like to give towards that, just raise your hand and one of our helpers will be around to take care of that for you. Lee, while I'm thinking about it, I'll go ahead and tell you, I could not get the final hymn to load for some reason, so we'll probably have to sing it out of the books. Just letting you know now, so we, uh, you know, so we remember later, so. All right, praise the Lord. Thank you all for your giving, and thank you to the kids uh, for being so willing to help and uh, collect that for us. At this time, we will go ahead and dismiss our kids' programs. We do have Children's Church, and we have the nursery available if anybody should need it. Um, a couple of prayer requests, things to continue to be in prayer for. Um, uh, of course, a lot of us are you know, aware of some of the things going on overseas. Be in prayer for, uh, for Israel, the conflict, the war, the things that are breaking out over there uh, with Palestine. Let's just remember the nation of Israel uh, and just, uh, as always, uh, trust God to act on the behalf of, of his people. So let's just be praying, uh, praying for that situation, of course. Uh, and we have several in our congregation who are in need of your prayers. They have uh, tests upcoming. They have procedures, they have surgeries, these different things. Uh, they're on the list. Uh, and of course, uh, if anybody would like to mention those, we'd be glad to say those aloud. Uh, I know there's a few that just wanted it unspoken. Uh, so, so that I don't say too much, I'll leave it at that, unless those people would like to say. Um, does anyone have any prayer concerns they'd like to mention this morning? Jennifer. She has her what? Okay, okay. And remind me her last name? Robinson. Robinson. Okay, Stacy Robinson is having her procedure tomorrow. Thank you. Anybody else? Amanda? Unspoken. Okay. David? Yeah, I have a coworker whose son just got in a motorcycle accident a couple days ago in San, San Diego. Um, and so he had to leave, and now I'm doing his job and my job. So okay. pray for his family, pray for the ministry. Absolutely. Yeah. Glennis? Eric Gillum. Sharon, did you raise your hand? I thought you did. I apologize. Thank you. Anyone else? Vicki? Tommy? Okay. We remember Jerry Ballard. Vicki? Said Carolyn and Kevin Benton. Okay. Absolutely. Be praying for them. Lee, unspoken. Family of Melvin Literal. Amy. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, for any who may not know. Uh, uh, Matthew Riley was our former youth minister here, and his wife, uh, uh, her name was Rachel, and of course was a, a tremendous part of the ministry. Um, Rachel's dad passed very unexpectedly Friday, and then they are beginning a, a new uh, ministry uh, in Bowling Green. Uh, Riley's now the senior pastor there, and his first Sunday is today. So it's, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot going on with him this weekend. Let's remember them in prayer. Melissa? Yeah. 
this. Anybody else? All right, well, I'll start. I have two praises. I'm happy to report that uh, Sabrina Frederick did have her baby. Uh, baby Sadie is healthy and doing well. Sabrina's doing well, and I know Daniel's very pleased as well. So we're just really thankful to the Lord for a healthy, healthy delivery and a healthy baby. Um, I also want to, uh, to, to say that I'm just thankful for the revival services that, uh, that took place, the countywide revival by the Ministerial Association this past week. I uh, specifically want to say uh, David, did a, David preached Monday, did a fantastic job. Uh, his, uh, his sermon was very powerful. It was, you know, of course, true to the scriptures, and uh, I'm just, just thankful for him and his faithfulness, and uh, that message was very impactful. So uh, I know that uh, there were quite a few of us. It was really encouraging to see so many from our church there to, to, to be there and, of course, support of what the Lord would do, but in support of our brother. So I'm just really thankful for that and that opportunity he had. Anyone else have a praise this morning? Tommy? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Anybody else? Linda? Linda? Praise the Lord. Glad to hear that. So thankful to hear that. Anybody else? Yeah, Grady. Okay. Praise the Lord. Glad to hear that. Amen. Anybody else? Anna? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're very proud of you. Thankful for you. And of course, we'll keep everyone who's struggling with whatever the addiction might be, we'll keep them in our prayers. Lisa? Amen. Amen. Yeah. We're glad to see you this morning, Tommy. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, sorry, Grady, were you going to say something? Oh, I, well, I thought you put your hand back up again. Sorry. All right, uh, Lord, I just thank you. Uh, Father, I, uh, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy. God, I want to begin by just saying uh, your name is majestic. Your name is awesome. God, you are worthy of all praise and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. God, you are holy. You are um, above uh, everything uh, that you have created. God, you are um, completely free from sin. You are completely righteous. There is no wickedness within you. There's no darkness within you, only light. There's no darkness in your presence even. Um, Father, I thank you that um, there is no lies within you. There is only truth. God, I thank you that there is no death within you. There is only life. Father, you are um, just ab above what we could ever hope to convey about you. God, your splendor, your majesty, your sovereignty, your love, your, all, your grace, your mercy, all the things um, that, that you do for us. But Father, uh, help us to never forget that you are pr praiseworthy because of your very nature. We don't just praise you because you do things for us or because you act on our behalf, and you do. Father, we know that you work for the good of those that love you and are called to your purposes. But Father, we also know that your name is worthy to be glorified. Father, you delight in the glorifying of your own name. And Father, it should be our concern in everything we do. And as we're going to say today, even through prayer, that we would glorify and honor you. So, Father, I pray that every time we go to you in prayer, um, we do so uh, confidently and boldly approach the throne of grace. But, Father, I also pray that we all, always come before you uh, reverently with a sense of awe and, and what a privilege it is that we have the ability to do this. Father, that we uh, as sinners, we can come before you and we can make our petitions known to you. Father, you are um, the creator of the entire universe, and yet you're also our Father, and you hear us. We are able to bring our concerns and our cares before you, uh, for you love us. 
We can bring our anxieties to you and cast our cares upon you. Father, I thank you so much for that truth. I pray that as we look to the scripture today, um, the Holy Spirit helps us. Father, I pray that, um, that he does the work, the ministry that he was given to us to do. He is the spirit of truth, and he does reveal the truth of your word. He leads and he guides your people. And Father, I thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Father, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit helps me as I preach and helps all of us as we hear. God, help us not to be hearers of the word, but doers. Help us to love your word. Help us to meditate upon it. And God, as we are going to talk about today, help us to be praying people. Help us to be people who consistently and constantly go to you in prayer. As if a man that has to breathe to live, we must be people that must pray. Father, we thank you. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. And if you want to mark uh, Psalm, I believe it's 86. Uh, You'd figure I should know that, but I've got it written down here. Psalm 86, yes, if you want to mark that as well. Our main text is going to be Matthew chapter 6, but also if you'd like to go ahead and mark for later, uh, Psalm 86. Uh, Today's sermon is titled, The Glory of Prayer, and as I alluded to uh, within the prayer, uh, the idea is that how we can pray in a way um, that honors God and that uh, heaps glory upon Him as He is due, Um, because that might not be something we often think about, um, but not only is it something we can do in prayer, I would argue it's the purpose of prayer, and we're going to speak about that today. Um, If you would stand with me as we go to the Word, Uh, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 6. We read verses 5 through 8 last week, and we're going to read verses 9 through 13 today. It says this, Jesus tells them, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You all may be seated. So last week, um, like I said, I had decided um, that that I felt God was impressing upon me that we should study prayer more closely. Uh, And last week, especially, I wanted us to discuss the necessity of prayer. Uh, And I was very honest that at times, uh, not just in my ministry, but just in my Christian life in general, uh, I have very much failed to give prayer the proper regard uh, in my life that I should. Um, Prayer is essential. We know that. I don't think any of us would dispute that. But yet oftentimes our prayer habits would convey the opposite. Even though we speak of how important prayer is and how absolutely vital it is to a Christian, and we can have quotes that say, uh, you know, to think that a Christian would not pray would be like a man who doesn't breathe. But how often do our habits actually reflect that? And so I want us to speak today about what happens, how we glory and honor God when we pray. I want to recall again the quote I shared last week, because I think it's so helpful, from Corey Ten Boom. She said, what wings are to a bird and sails are to a ship, so is prayer to the soul. In other words, as the prayer goes, the prayer goes. As we put forth our prayers, we will surely be to follow. We cannot hope to accomplish anything as, as individual Christians, uh, as a corporate body, as a, as, as a congregation here, West Liberty Christian Church, without much prayer. And if we want to align ourselves with God's will and, 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 and advance God's kingdom and make sure that we are doing all that we can to be obedient to his will, we have to pray. There are, there are no spiritual disciplines that can be elevated above the reading of Scripture and the commitment to prayer. These two things are the pillars that should be within every, uh, every second of our daily life um, th- that, that hold the believer up as they seek to honor God in obedience. Right? Prayers are speaking to God and the reading of the word is God speaking to us. And so through the word and through prayer, there's a uh, interchange, there's a dialogue, there's a conversation occurring between man and God. And it has to be consuming elements in our life, that constant dialogue. And once again, to quote as we did last week, a Christian who neglects to pray is like a man who neglects to breathe. Now the Lord's Prayer, we set it up last week, we're going to actually look at the contents of it this week. It's recorded multiple places in the Gospel. Uh, Luke 11 specifically has some context that I'll be referencing that's important. But as we've already read, we are in Matthew chapter 6. 
It's in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Um, it's, it's almost like this, uh, obviously it's an instruction on prayer, but it's right in the middle of this sermon, this really famous and important sermon. And I think that's just one of his ways of elevating the importance of prayer. Now in Luke 11, we know that at least once Jesus offers this instruction on prayer as a response to a question from his disciples. They witness him praying, they, they are just, you know, they, they don't interrupt him, they, they let him finish his prayer, and they say, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. They noticed that there was something about Jesus' prayers that their prayers were different from. And so they ask him if he would teach them as a teacher would a student how to pray. Now, we saw last week, he started with a negative example. He says, don't be like the hypocrites who pray for the attention of people, and don't pray like the pagans who are trying to convince God of something. They're babbling, they're trying to use eloquent speech and reason so that they can pull God on board with them. He says, don't pray in either of those ways, right? He's reinforcing through negative examples. You don't want to be like the hypocrites, you don't want to be like the pagans. And then this week we look, he says, instead, do this. Instead, pray in this way. And that's where we find ourselves today. Um, he, he makes the great point after they ask him this, um, first the negative example, and then he makes the, the great point about how fitting prayer may be, and he doesn't go towards uh, praying in a circumstance or where you are when you pray or what posture you're in. He doesn't go into any of those details that would have been a fine and good discussion to have, especially if it comes from the mouth of our Lord. But instead, he speaks about how they should pray by giving them a model or a framework for how they would speak to God. It's important that we understand as we read this, this prayer, um, it is absolutely a good thing for us to memorize. It's a good thing for us to pray back to God, but he doesn't give it to us with the idea that we would just rotely memorize it and just regurgitate it back to him and do no critical thinking, right? He's not just giving us the words that we would memorize and literally say, though they're of course, they're the words of the Lord, they're beneficial for that. But He is giving us a framework, right? We could also translate when he says pray like this to pray along these lines, right? He's giving an example. He's giving a model from which they are to learn from. I think of it as like a framework, or I read one commentary that said Jesus here gives them the skeleton, and as they pray, their prayers come to life as as, as life is brought to the body of this skeleton that he's given them the model in prayer. And so I want us to hear this. Above all, the things that Jesus is seeking to teach in the Lord's Prayer, as we have it here, above all, more than anything, this prayer teaches that the focus of prayer is not upon us, It's not upon our needs, it's not upon our circumstance, it's not upon our situation. The focus of prayer must be upon God. Every prayer, it must be upon Him. And that might sound strange to us, but I think we'll make it, the, the case will be made very clear for us. Because everything in this prayer, everything in this model, this framework we have, every single statement not only focuses on God, but I believe it reveals something of his character and his nature that is worthy of our praise. Now, I'm going to run through these kind of fast, but I will uh, repeat them again throughout the sermon as we go. It begins with our Father. That's God's paternity, right? It's his paternity. He is our Father. Um, Hallowed be thy name. That's his priority. His name is to be reverenced. His name is to be hallowed and lifted up and made much of. Thy kingdom come, that's the program, right? We get on his program and that's advancing his kingdom and thy will be done. That's his purpose, right? It reveals God's purpose that we would follow and align ourselves with his will. Give us this day our daily bread. That's God's provision. We trust that as we go through this life and as we follow him, he will give us the things that we need. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's his pardon. It reminds us that he extends mercy to his people and that we should extend that mercy in turn to others. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That alludes to his protection, that he is a shield, a fortress, a stronghold to his people. And yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. That's his preeminence. We could have said priority again there, but then we would use priority twice. So we're going to use preeminence. Every phrase that's within this prayer speaks of God and seeks to put him in his place. And by put him in his place, I mean his majestic infinite, glorious, worthy of praise place that he deserves in our life. 
That's the purpose of prayer, that we would honor God, that we would heap glory upon his name, that we would align ourselves with his will. That's the thrust of this entire prayer, right? It's, it's, it's a focus upon the glory of God. It's instructive to us that all prayer, when we pray, no matter what our concerns are, and we're going to speak about what it means to make our petitions known to him, because I don't mean that we just don't bring up our cares or concerns to him, because that's certainly not the case. But all of our prayer has to be centered around the fact that we are seeking to acknowledge God and give him his due glory. Because even when we bring our petitions, our cares, our concerns, our struggles, our needs before him, in a way, we are still showing that we trust him enough to know what's best for us and that he's good enough to give that to us. And so prayer is, in a sense, it honors God by showing these two things, deference and dependence. What I mean by that is we defer to God. It's his will. We trust him. We're dependent on him. We submit to him. We defer to him. And dependence. We trust him. We know that he will act on our best interest, and we trust him to do so. And so there's such a beautiful contrast we're going to see, especially here in a moment with some of the words we're going to analyze. But there's this contrast between us acknowledging his majesty, right, his, his worthiness to be praised, his sovereignty, that means his authority, his control, his glorious nature, his will, his might, his holy nature, but also his care and concern for us as children. There's such a beautiful contrast that we're going to see that he is both the king, the creator of all, the Lord of all creation, but yet he also says he is our father. And yet when we pray, if we are not elevating the name of God, if we are not making much of him, and I don't just literally mean his name, right? I mean his being, his character, his nature, everything about him. If in our prayers we're not elevating his name, then I think we are not approaching prayer with a correct understanding of its purpose. Because prayer must be God-centered in nature. As we said last week, prayer is not us trying to convince God that our way is best. It's not us trying to say, please get on board with my will. I've done the research. I've studied it. This is a really good plan. I've done all the thinking for you. It's nothing like that. Jesus is teaching his disciples here that true prayer is when we affirm God's authority over our lives, when we worship him and glorify him for his majesty and we reject the self-will and instead embrace the God will. So in other words, it means we trust that God is wise enough, powerful enough, and good enough. He's wise enough to know what's best for his people. He's powerful enough to bring about that good for his people. And he's good enough to not withhold that good from his people. That's where it comes back to dependence. If we can truly trust all these things about God, if we trust he's wise enough, powerful enough, good enough, then we should be able to trust him when he gives us a yes or a no, when he answers our prayers, whether it's what we would want or not. And that's why we're able to be obedient to him, to submit to his will, because we know that his nature and character is pure and perfect. And so he frees us from a life when we would just pursue ourselves, right? We don't have to build up self-esteem. As my counselor says, we build up God esteem. When we recognize God for who he is and see his nature, we will view ourselves more appropriately in light of that. It's not that I would build myself up so that I'll feel better about myself and be a better Christian. It's really the opposite. I make much of God, and then in light of that, I see the promises in Scripture, I see the truths that it tell, and I will see myself appropriately in light of that. I think that's what Jesus is saying. He would commend to us in prayer that we put the majesty of God on display in our prayers. We keep our focus heavenward, and we seek, even in the way that we pray, to heap glory upon his name. Right? It's an opportunity for us, it's a privilege for us to see and let God display his majesty in and through and by our lives. And it gives us the opportunity to align ourselves with his will. Whew, I got really on one there. We notice here that Jesus, when he starts here, when he starts, he says, in this manner, he honors God's holiness because he says, our father, and we'll come back to that, but he says, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, what does hallowed mean? You probably think Halloween when you hear the word hallow. The word hallowed here means, uh, it means holy. 
It means pure. It means set apart. It means reverenced. And so just as we have been talking about, when we pray, I would argue the, the best thing that we can do to start is acknowledging God for who he is, for acknowledging his perfect, holy nature, to, to raising his name above all others, including our own. And so we, uh, we approach God in prayer in this manner in which we think about his perfection and his perfect nature. And then when we approach the throne with boldness, we will also do so reverently, right? We can and must do both. We can approach God confidently and know that he cares and has concern for our concerns, but yet he's also our king and our master, Right? He's also the creator, the sovereign over all of the universe. And so we approach him both in a way that recognizes his holiness, but also recognizes the privilege that we can call him our father. And I don't want us to miss that. It is a tremendous privilege that we can go to the Lord in prayer because we recognize that we're sinners, right? Or we should. If you don't, I'm sorry, you're a sinner. Um, we recognize that we're sinners, right? We recognize that God is holy. He is righteous. As I said in the prayer, there's no unrighteousness within him. And so from that perspective, what a privilege it is that we can boldly go before his throne. And so when we keep that in mind, what a privilege it is, what an honor it is, how much more, how much easier will it be to remember that it's about his kingdom and his will rather than our kingdom and our will, right? His kingdom, his will, his purpose, his glory, all these things must take priority, of course, in our lives, but there's no hope of that being the case in our lives if even in our prayers, these things don't take priority, so even when we pray, we need to resist the tendency to protect or to promote ourselves first. It's always God-centric. It's always God first. You see that in the prayers recorded in Scripture. It's all throughout. And I want you, next time you're reading Scripture, you come to a prayer, notice it. It's in every prayer within the Bible. Biblical prayers always start in the way that Jesus is commending here. It's a worshipful state of mind in which the people who are praying seek to first honor God and first attribute to him the glory he is due, and then they bring their concerns before him. Just a few examples. This one gets me the most. Jonah, we know he was in a pretty gross situation, right? In the belly of a great big fish. And yet when he prays, he doesn't start with the obvious. He doesn't say, God, I think you know my problem. Please get me out of here. I think something needs to be done. Vomit me out of this fish's mouth. Please get me out of this. This is a nightmare. He doesn't start there. Instead, his prayer starts as an anthem of praise and worship. And only once he has reverenced God and made his name great and made much of it and hallowed his name, does he then present his petitions before him. Similarly, we look at uh, Daniel, and, and, and it, he didn't mention his immediate needs until after he had affirmed the greatness of God's character, and then he presented his petitions before him. When the prophet Jeremiah was perplexed, he's pouring out his soul in prayer. He recites, attribute after attribute, how majestic God is. We see that's just three examples. It's all throughout the Bible. And I think that tells us something important, because if we don't acknowledge that God is the sovereign, the authority who can do something about it, right? If he's not wise enough, powerful enough, and good enough, why would we bother asking him to meet our needs in the first place? How can we ask anything of God and expect him to act on our behalf if we do not first affirm that he alone has the sovereign right to say yes or no? That he alone has the wisdom to know whether the yes, the no, or the maybe later is what is best for us. Right? To know that he is good enough that he will act on behalf of his people. Right? And he loves us enough that he will act in that manner. If we don't first acknowledge that, what's the point in going to him with our petitions? Turn with me to Psalm 86. I think there's a really good uh, example of this before we go on in the text in Matthew. Psalm 86 I'm going to read verses 5 through 13. No, verses, uh, yes, 5 through 13. <clears throat> For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations that you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and they shall glorify your name. 
For you are great and you do wondrous things, for you alone are God. Therefore, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. What a good, what a wonderful example of what we're talking about here, because the psalmist clearly has some sort of trouble on their mind, right? And they clearly even go to God and make their petitions and say, save me, hear me, I need you. Right, But even as he is greatly troubled, he does not fail to glorify God's perfect name and nature. Right? He doesn't just start by begging and saying, God, you don't know what it's like to be in this situation. Deliver me at this very instant. Instead, he relies upon what he knows is God's nature and says, I trust you. You especially see that in verses 11 through 13. I'll read them again. It says, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. So even in the midst of his trouble, he says, show me your way so that I may walk in it. Make my heart to be like your heart, and please allow me to glorify your name forever. Right? It showcases this idea that we defer to God, we trust his wisdom, and we depend on him, the fact that he is able and he is good enough to bring about what he knows is best for his children. And then the other obvious truth in this, and I said I was going to come back to it, it starts not just with in heaven, hallowed be thy name, but those first two words, our father. There's such a contrast as we consider God's majesty, his greatness, his authority over all of creation. His name is great and hallowed above all things. We are praying to the one who is in heaven, whose name is above all, who is worthy of all glory and honor and power. And yet he says we are his children. These realities are both true and as striking as that may sound, it's such a powerful truth to realize both realities are true at the same time. He is a God of majesty, a God of dominion, a God of power and might. He sees everything, right? He is over all. He is worthy of all glory and honor and praise, and yet he gives us the privilege that we may call him Father, right? To say our Father in heaven, it's not an invocation. If I write a letter to David, I would say, dear David, that's not what's happening here, right? We, you know, Jesus isn't saying, when you pray, pray to God, don't pray to the devil. They know that. He's not saying that. It's not an invocation as saying it's an address. When he says our Father in heaven, it's not a dear John moment in a dear John letter. He begins his prayer with a recognition that God is his Father. And that is true in congruity at the same time with his kingship, his majesty, his authority over all creation, that none of those things prevent him from having a personal relationship with us and adopting us into his family and loving us as his children. And so like a father, when we understand that, that he has power over all things, yet he chooses to love us, that's why we can defer to his wisdom and that's why we can trust him because like a father, he is concerned for us. He loves us. He has the wisdom and the power and the goodness to act on our behalf. And the Bible tells us and promises us that he will do so. I believe it's so important for us to recognize both of these things because I think people swing too far in either direction. Either he's some cold and callous king who has all power, yet he doesn't care enough to act on behalf of his people, or he has all this love and then there's no sense of holiness. There's no sense of reverence. There's no care for the majesty of his name. Both are overreactions. It's somewhere in the middle. Both are true at the same time. He is simultaneously approachable as a father is, yet he is distinctly holy and separate from all unrighteousness. Both things are true at the same time. He is both the mighty sovereign over all the universe who created and governs and judges according to his wisdom, and yet he's also a father who knows his children, who loves his children, and who knows what they need. He is a father, but one who is worthy of all glory, honor, and respect. I also appreciate how he doesn't say my father, he says our father, right? This prayer is a social element. It's for the believing community. It's not just Jesus. We become adopted into his family as sons and daughters. And so all who pray to him in the name of the son with the help of the spirit to the father are in the family. 
And so when we pray, we pray as one, as a family. Now going on, Jesus teaches that the right type of prayer, um, it has a passion for God's glory and a passion for God's agenda, right? So we start, it's a tremendous privilege that we even have the opportunity to come before this holy God in prayer. But then because of that, in recognition of that, we are well done to clearly state that he and what he has for us is the top priority. It's thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? How could we affirm that he is all these wonderful and majestic things and then say, oh God, please advance my kingdom, right? Do we not see how incongruous that is to do that? We pray for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? In heaven, there will be no disobedience. There is no obstacles to the accomplishment of his will. And we know that on this earth, there's nothing that could prevent him from his will, but there is much disobedience. And we know that, And as his children, we should not look at that and say, oh, well, your will is going to be done. I don't really need to do anything. I don't really need to worry about it. That's the exact wrong approach to take. As his children who love him uh, and who see the privilege it is to be called his children, we should want freely to see his will done now, not just in some future reality in heaven, but now on earth as it is in heaven. We're to pray in a way that shows that we trust him and we defer to his wisdom and we depend upon him. Here's the thing about our will. It's not always in opposition to Jesus, but it's always secondary, right? There will be times when I will pray and it'll be guided by the scriptures and absolutely it'll be a righteous thing to ask for, but it still wasn't my will, right? It was still guided by him the entire time. And so our will always has to be secondary to his Jesus modeled that in the garden as he was praying. And David referenced this uh, Monday in his sermon, um, the power of the word nevertheless. Even though Jesus was was very, uh, he was was praying and he was sweating blood and he was fervent in his prayer, he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. It's always what thou will, not what we will. We recognize it's a privilege to approach him in prayer, and so too is it a privilege that we would be obedient to his will and the coming of his kingdom. Now going on, give us this day our daily bread. At some point in our prayers, we make our petitions known to God. I would never ever make the argument that we don't bring our concerns before him because in fact, I believe that very much would be unbiblical. We should bring our cares and concerns to him because as a father, he cares for us. It is appropriate that we bring our concerns before him and we ask him to make provision for our needs, but we always need to keep the right perspective that a God-centered prayer will seek for his will and his kingdom above even our own needs. And so we trust him who loves us and is wise and powerful enough to meet those needs. Because God cares for his children, he will not deny them the things that he has deemed that they need. But we also must recognize that as we ask for our daily supplication, we have to trust that what he gives will be according to his discretion, right? I heard a quote that said, when we go to prayer, we ask him for our needs, not our greeds, right? We don't ask him for the things that are greedy, that are selfish, that are self-centered. We ask for our needs and we trust that he will meet them. But yet we still take our petitions before him. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. And if I pray without ceasing and pray continuously, I'm going to take a lot of little things for him, right? And it might sound silly to someone else to pray for such a small thing, but there is no small thing in the eye of the father who loves his children. He is glad when his children bring their concerns before him because I think it shows a couple of things. One, that they trust him. Even in the petty and small, seemingly insignificant things in their life, one, his children trust him. And two, it allows the opportunity for them to submit everything in their lives, even the small, seemingly insignificant things, according to his will. And we pray for our daily bread, and we trust that he'll give us accordingly to what we need that day. But remember, I saw this quote too, I like this. We pray for our daily bread, we don't pray for a storehouse of bread or a bakery. We don't pray that we can manufacture the bread for ourselves and we don't say, God, give me enough so I never have to ask for daily bread again. We trust him each day to give us the things that we need. We approach this holy God who loves us as a father loves a child. We come before his throne with reverence and we honor him, but also we cast our cares before him. And because he loves us and because he is able, he will act on behalf of his people. 
So what are some of the provisions we might need daily? Well, of course, that could apply to physical things. But also specifically, I appreciate that Jesus emphasizes forgiveness. And he says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Right? We need to forgive and be forgiven and seek forgiveness daily. Just as we need bread to eat, we need mercy and forgiveness. Some other provisions, we might ask for uh, physical things, ask for forgiveness. We might cry out to God for his mercy, for his help, for wisdom, for strength during times of temptation, for boldness, for the filling of the Holy Spirit, for our anxieties, for our emotions, for our depression, for our hopelessness, for our fear, for our confusion, for our anger, for our hurt feelings at others. We bring all these things before him. We trust the help he provides, and tomorrow we're going to do it again. Daily, he meets the needs of his people. And what a comfort it is to know that we serve a God, that of all the things that are on his mind in all creation, that of all the issues that we can bring before him that seemingly are so petty and insignificant in relation, it gives me such peace of mind to know that he comforts his children as a father does the child he loves. He works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. He cares for us, even the minute aspects of our lives. Going on, two more points before we bring it to a conclusion. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This reminds us that as we go, it is God who will lead us. We don't say, God, let me forge the path. Let me make the trail. I've thought about this. I know what's best. It's none of those things. We ask daily in our prayers that he would lead us. We trust in his leadership, and that will prevent us Ideally, that would prevent us, but as sheep, we often stray. Um, That would prevent us from trying to forge our own path or straying from the path that he has given us, right? Meeting our own needs, doing things according to our own timeline, providing our own answers. We've seen it in our life. We've seen it in scripture. We've seen it all throughout. It is never good when we take matters into our own hands. So we trust that God will give us the guidance and that we ought to follow it and submit to it. And finally, it ends by saying, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is just as I see it, another reminder of God's majesty. It's another reminder of his authority over our lives. And if prayer is always to be an expression of praise in which we can glorify his name, here, even as we end our prayer, it's like a reminder, God, I want to add even more glory onto your name, and I want to credit you for everything that you deserve. Because when we pray, yours is the kingdom, we are conceding that ultimately we trust that his will is going to be done and that he has the wisdom to bring it about. We remind ourselves that he is the creator of all. All things are his and belong to him. And thus he is worthy of all things, including our obedience. And thus we end as we began. We, be- we end this prayer in the same manner that we began. We are putting the focus squarely in our prayers where it belongs upon God. Because he's owed all. He is worthy of all. He is due all. And if our prayers are not a reflection of, of a desire to be aligned with his will and advance his kingdom, then our prayers are self-focused and they're not God-centric. We have no hope of aligning the actions of our lives with the Lord if even our prayers don't reflect a desire to be in his will and to advance his kingdom. Why would we believe that we could align our lives if we can't even align our prayers? And yet we can. The Bible tells us that we can put on the mind of Christ and that we can go before him and that's what prayer ought to be. And so I want us to consider these things. Consider your prayer life. Next time you pray, all the prayers you've prayed, how often you pray, all that stuff, and ask yourself these questions. Do the prayers that you pray sound like prayers that are recorded in the Bible? And of course, this isn't an exhaustive sermon on prayer. We couldn't do that in one sitting here. But do the prayers that you pray sound like the way the Bible represents what prayer ought to be? According to the Lord's Prayer, do our prayers reflect what Jesus says our prayers should reflect? Because I think if we look at it, we can see that the way we pray will show something about what we truly believe. So according to how we pray, answer these questions. Who is God and who am I compared to him? What do I expect from him? What is God's purpose? What is my purpose? 
Whose will, whose kingdom, whose glory am I working towards? Ask yourself all these questions and genuinely examine yourselves to see if we are aligning in these ways. Because if we're not, and I have no trouble admitting this, I am like those disciples who needed to go before the Lord and say, Lord, teach us how to pray. And I, I absolutely have no issue admitting that, right? In fact, I would say that we humbly should admit that, that we need to be taught how to pray. And even once we know how to pray, we still are going to need help developing in prayer. And I have this, I found this, this beautiful prayer, and I'll close with this, and then I'll, act, you know, I'll close with another prayer for us. Uh, it's a Scottish pastor in the 19th century. His name was Andrew Murray, and he prayed this, and I think this is so beautiful, and it was you know, based upon the words of the Lord's Prayer. He says, Blessed Lord, you who ever lives to pray, you teach me to pray, me that I can ever live to pray. In doing so, you love me to make me share your glory in heaven, that I should pray without ceasing, and that I can ever stand as a priest in the presence of my God. Lord Jesus, I ask you this day, enroll my name among those who confess that they do not know how to pray as they ought. And especially, I ask you for a course in teaching in prayer. Lord, teach me to wait with you in the school and give you time to train me. May a deep sense of my ignorance, the wonderful privilege and the power of prayer, of the need of the Holy Spirit as the spirit of prayer, lead me to cast away my thoughts of what I think I know and make me kneel before you in teachableness and poverty of spirit. And fill me, Lord, with the confidence that with a teacher like you, I shall learn to pray. In the assurance that I have as my teacher, Jesus, who is ever praying to the Father, and by his prayer rules the destinies of his church in the world, I should not be afraid. As much as I need to know the mysteries of the prayer world, you will fold for me. And when I may not know, you will teach me to be strong in faith and give glory to God. Blessed Lord, you will not put to shame your student who trusts you, nor by your grace would he put you to shame either. Amen. Let's close with prayer. Father God, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the privilege it is that we can approach you. God, there's, but, but aside from your grace, from your mercy, for your love that, that, that proceeded forth in the person of Jesus, the giving of the Spirit, God, there is no reason, there is no merit by which we should be able to approach you other than the fact that we are children. God, there is no reason that we should be able to approach the throne, the throne at all, let alone boldly and with confidence, let alone that we could cast our cares upon you, that we could make our anxieties known to you because you care for us. God, in, in fact, sinners such as I, God, there's no reason we should be able to approach a, a holy, majestic God of all creation whatsoever. But yet, Father, out of your mercy, your grace, your infinite love, you have made a way for that to be so. So, Father, we recognize that you are glorious, you are worthy of praise. God, help us to honor and glorify your name in everything that we do. Help us to see the importance of prayer if we, want, we say that we want to live a life that honors you. We say we want to have a church that is going in whatever direction you want us to, and yet so often we neglect prayer both personally and corporately as a congregation. God, help us to be people who constantly come before you in prayer who depend upon everything that you would see fit to give us. And God, we constantly defer to your will. God, it's your kingdom come. It's your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, it's not about us. Help us in this moment and in the time following to examine ourselves and see what our prayer life, the things we pray and our habits, what they reveal about who we believe that you are and what the purpose of prayer is. And Father, when we are self-centered in our prayer or in our actions, God, help us. I thank you for your mercy. God, I am flawed. I'm so often ignorant. And so, Father, whether it's rebellion or whether it's ignorance, God, I so often promote myself first. Father, I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your forgiveness. God, just as I need bread to sustain me every day, so do I need mercy. And thankfully, your mercies are new every morning. Father, you're, you will give us this day. You will give us our daily bread. And God, that includes the mercy that we need for our failures. 
So, Father, help us to be people who recognize the great privilege it is to pray. And because of our great love for you, we would pray prayers that are centered upon you, Father, upon your will and upon your kingdom. God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to come before you in this manner. And, Father, I pray that all of us can have the humility, the poverty of spirit to say, Lord, teach us to pray. God, we're not praying as we could. We're not praying as we should. God, we're not praying at all. God, help us to have that humility to say, Lord, teach us to pray. But, Father, also to have the confidence to know that our teacher will teach us how to pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you're my king, you're my sovereign, and I thank you that you're my father. I'm thankful that even though I shouldn't be able to come before you, God, you have made a way so that I may. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. I do want to be clear. The only way we can draw near to the Father, the Bible tells us, is through the Son. Right? He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. So for the sake of clarity, if we want to approach this righteous, holy, perfect God who has no part of unrighteousness, we have to have an intermediator, and that is Jesus Christ. And because of him, because of his sacrifice, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit and we can go before the Lord and the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. And so if anyone is in here and has not made that acknowledgement, I would beg and encourage and plead you to do so, to repent of unrighteousness and wickedness. It doesn't mean that you're automatically going to stop sinning, but you will sin less. You will be continually conformed into the image of Christ according to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. For those of us that have had that and we are God's children, we thank the Lord for that and we continue to step forward in the work that he has. But I just had to make that plea that if anybody has yet to do so, I would beg of you and all of us, brothers and sisters in the Lord, would beg of you to do so today. Would you all please stand? I'm going to piggyback on what he just said. We're going to sing a song from the hymnals, page 551. And it's a song that says, the king is coming. We're reminded in John 14 that Jesus said to his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be where I am. Jesus is coming. The King is coming, but you have to be ready. And I beg you, the praise praise and worship team begs you, just as Hunter just begged you, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, make this, this time, this opportunity that's given to you, the time where you can find out who Jesus is and that love he has for you so that you can experience what we are going to be singing about in just a little bit the joy the rewards the peace the glory the majesty of heaven the king is coming are you ready if not please come forward Hunter will definitely pray with you is empty, no more traffic in the streets, all the builders' schools are silent, no more time to harvest weeds, busy housewives cease their labors, in the corporate no debate, work on earth is all suspended, as the king comes to the gate. Oh, the King is coming. The King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now His face I see. Oh, the King
just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming. Praise God, He's coming for me. I can hear the chariots rumble, I can see the marching throng. God's trumpet spells the end of sin and wrong. Regal robes are now unfolding. Heaven's grand stands on in place. Heaven's choir is now assembled. Start to sing amazing grace. Oh, the King is coming. Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming, praise God, He's coming for me. Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming, I just heard. Trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. Oh, the king is coming, the king is coming. Praise God, he's coming for me. Just a beautiful reminder, and I thank the Lord uh, for, for what the Scripture teaches us, and that very powerful reminder. Uh, a couple of announcements, things I'd like you to remember. Uh, we do have our, our meetings tomorrow. Um, the elders will meet at 6, and then the, the board will meet at 7 in the, the, the fellowship hall downstairs. Um, Friday is the fish fry. Uh, from 4 to 7 p.m., we're going to be serving. Uh, we will need volunteers, and we could definitely use some desserts. So uh, if anybody could, uh, it's always easiest to make something you could uh, kind of individually give out pretty easily. So please remember that. We'll need both volunteers and desserts. Um, remember Remember the shoe boxes. I apologize I didn't play a video today. We'll have another one next week. But remember the shoe boxes. Uh, remember what we are trying to uh, accomplish with that. Yes, it's good to give a child a gift, but even more so, we are trying to spread the gospel and partner with Samaritan's Purse and bring the gospel to the lives and hearts of these children. Uh, and then October 22nd, uh, it's going to be a really fun day. We're going to have a fall fellowship. After the service, we'll have a soup potluck. Uh, and then for anybody who can hang around, we'll have yard games. We'll be able, The kids will be able to decorate some pumpkins and little little things like that so that's going to be really fun keep that in mind on your calendar october 22nd and we hope that you'll come out for that anyone else have an announcement uh, yes Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, and if, once again, if you have any questions about that, what it's, uh, what you include in the boxes, what it's trying to accomplish, anything with the ministry, feel free to come uh, and, and ask me. And if I don't know, I've, I've, there's some wonderful people behind the scenes who, who often tell me not to name them, uh, who are working really hard, and so I'm thankful for them. And if I don't know, I'll, uh, I know some people who do know, so I'll say that. Um, anyone else have an announcement or anything? Dave? 
Andrew Moore. Yeah. Uh, Amen. Amen. All right. Grab a hand of somebody next to you. Uh, we'll close with prayer. Father God, we thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate so much this symbol that as we, uh, we join hands uh, and pray with one another, Father, we are uh, a family. We're brothers and sisters, and we are going before our Father. Um, our Father is also the King. He is, uh, God, you are the authority. You've created all things. You're sovereign. God, your will uh, is, is, is perfect. Your, your wisdom is perfect. God, everything about you and your nature is perfect. God, we come before you as one with one voice, as the family, as, the, as siblings with one another. We come before our Father, and God, we want to make your name great. We want you to do the work within us, within this congregation, within this community that you've created us in Christ Jesus to do. God, we want to heap honor and glory upon your name. Father, help us to be obedient. Help us when we have little faith, Father, to trust. We ask that you increase our trust and our dependence upon you. Father, when we would think selfishly, help us to defer to you. Father, when we would try to act self-sufficiently and independently, God, help us to depend on you and not upon ourselves. Father, we always want to say, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes. Father, I pray that you help us. God, even in the way that we would pray, God, even in the way that we ask you for your help, God, we need your help and we ask that you would do so. And Father, we trust that we have that help. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you for his ministry. I thank you for the way that he helps us to pray before you. And Father, even when there's times when our concerns and cares are so burdensome, we don't know what to say, he will pray on our behalf. Father, I thank you for that beautiful truth. I thank you for the things that we've learned today. I pray and I beg for your help as we leave here and help us to be people that love you and be people that see the necessity of constant and continual prayer. Father, we love you. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Cornerstone, weak made strong in the same.